So yeah, my name is Matt Ball. Um, uh, Jill already gave you a bit of a background that I'm the founding partner, one of the founding partners with Paul of the, the business. Channel Creator has been around for 13 years. Our first client um, was a Canadian client called Hostopia, uh, and they are still a client today. So we've got some, some really good experience of doing business with, uh, with companies from the Canadian market, uh, of which Hostopia is absolutely not the only one. Um, I'm gonna invite Paul and Elias to introduce themselves later because they've both got roles in the session and so you'll hear a little bit about them. Uh, but I've been in the software market in e-commerce and associated markets uh, since 2001, uh, where Paul was my boss's boss's boss back in the, uh, the good old days. And, uh, and, and now I focus a lot of my time on go-to-market strategy uh, and leading some of our key client engagements and, and bringing them to the UK market and also to other parts of Europe. And, uh, and so we will talk a little bit about that uh, jump off from UK to Europe as we go through the session. So uh, we've, we've got the title doing business in the UK, uh, but we've also mentioned this concept of, of not compromising your domestic business. And I think what we want to say here is that we want, we, we're very much about how you can enter a new market in the leanest possible way. So with the greatest level of efficiency, so that you don't put enormous strain on your business in your home market, because especially looking at, at you know, many of the businesses on this call are in that kind of sub million growing, growing revenues, uh, maybe in kind of seed or early A stage uh, of growth. There's not a huge amount of resource and, uh, and, and money to go around when you're at that stage of growth. And so you have to be smart about how you spend your resources, how you spend your time. So everything we talk about in this session has a little bit of that. How do you do things? How can you start lean? How can you start with the absolute essentials and then build out as you become that growth, that scale up, that, uh, that anchor type business? So hopefully we'll cover all of that off in the, in the next, uh, the coming minutes. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about how the UK differs. Uh, we're going to talk about what you really need to do, uh, what you almost definitely don't need to do. Uh, and what you can kind of consider as a nice to have as you go in, into the UK market. Um, we're also going to talk about channel. Um, uh, and one of the reasons is because we're called channel creator. So it'd be a bit remiss of us not to mention it. But we also see channel as, as having an essential part as you enter the UK market, not only because of the UK, but because of the way it sets you up for Europe. So we will talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, and so that then leads naturally into how can the UK be that jump off point and how can it help to prepare you for the European market um, as, as you grow your business uh, into the, the EU 27 as it now is. Uh, and the final point is, is around Brexit. And again, great to hear David giving us the, the lowdown on the trade relationships and the, and the timeframes for that. I'm going to talk about it much more on a, an on the ground level in terms of what impact we have seen thus far, not only over the last four years in terms of confidence and business response and that kind of thing, but in the last few weeks as we've come out of the back of the economic transition. So we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, just give you a bit of a, a sense of what we're seeing um, on the ground. So we wanted to start off by saying, how does the UK differ just in terms of the, the shape and size and structure of the market? So what you'll see uh, just on the left hand side, you'll see a little bit about the growth of businesses. This is a this is actually a really good briefing paper that I, I dug out um, a few weeks back, uh, which is provided by the House of Commons in the UK. So it's publicly available. It's very, very fresh. So it's January 2021. Um, and what you'll see is it gives you a bit of a sense of the, the, the growth in the number of businesses in the UK over the last 20 years. And, uh, and you'll see it's up around the 6 million mark. So if you compare that to other European countries, uh, I would say only two or three, maybe uh, uh, France, Italy um, have, have similar levels of, of small business uh, market to go after. So if you're in that SME sector, uh, you'll see on the left hand side, you've got the micro SMEs, the micro businesses here, uh, up to nine employees are an incredibly important part of the economy and the way that the, the, the world is structured over here. So, um, you know, just think about the fact there are a lot of entrepreneurs and I think we're going to see even more of that over the next two years in response to uh, in response to the pandemic and people going out, you know, leaving corporate jobs and, and going into startups and being entrepreneurs. So I think you're going to see a huge amount of innovation and, and good stuff going on there. 
Uh, there are also a lot of grants in, uh, you know, in the UK and across Europe for individuals that want to set up tech based businesses. So, again, as you're partnering, as you're thinking about the sorts of business you're going after, hugely important sector to go after. Uh, and you'll see the vanishingly small large up at the top here. So in the 250 uh, plus employee companies, we've got some significant players in there. Um, but in terms of the percentages and the numbers, uh, get in that six million, you're, you're down in the kind of tens of thousands at that point. So it's uh, it, it's a small portion, but it's a lot of a lot of money and a lot of employment and a lot of uh, a lot of very strong brands. The other thing I wanted to say about the, the, that before I talk about ecom, uh, which is very close to our hearts, if you have a look at the the structure of the uh, the, the market, 71% is services. So you know, UK is very well known to be a very very service centric country. Uh, and I would say that um, if you then look at what makes up the majority of that 71%, it's retail, as you can see on the screen. And retail being a huge part of the backbone of the, uh, of the UK economy, um, retail has been hard hit. But as a result, retail is, is responding by really aggressively tooling up in the, in the digital space. So all across that retail supply chain, from the very, you know, from the sourcing of the goods right through to the endpoints, the the cybersecurity, the payments, all of those things associated. Um, everything, you know, the, the UK has already got a heritage in e-commerce uh, and is known to be a, a, one of the market leaders because we have such a reliance on the retail sector. Um, but we've seen a massive, massive increase. So over the last year, we've seen that 20% market share, which was already a good level of penetration in terms of uh, of market share. Uh, of, of, of retail sales that are being done online, that's jumped to 35% um, across the course of that last year. So I think we're gonna see that as a lasting impact of the pandemic as we come out of the other end. And as you may know, we're starting to unlock, we've done about, I think a third or more of our adult population has had, a, had the first vaccination and such like. So as we make progress on that front, you're gonna see a, a big bounce back of, of retail and all the furloughed staff on furloughing. And there's going to be a real hunger for technology in that market. Not, you know, not to mention the other markets, but it, it is one of the real important sectors in this uh, in this space. And again, as you can see at the bottom, highly mobile, highly kind of social, local in, in our focus as well. So there's a huge amount of usage of those mobile experiences and platforms. So anyway, uh, I will let you read the paper because the House of Commons have done a great job of uh, uh, of talking through. Uh, exactly what um, uh, what the market looks like. So, in terms of uh, in terms of how the UK differs, we thought we'd start off with a, a number of flippant comments about uh, uh, ludicrous examples of localization, um, just to, to underline a point which is is more serious, I guess. Which is um, a lot of companies in, in in North America, especially Canadian companies that are preparing themselves to to go into new markets, go to the US, and then there is something of a US flavor to what then comes over to the UK. And I guess what we'd say is it, it really, it's noticeable when a business from Canada goes to the trouble uh, and, and, and from the US, uh, uh, you know, as well. When those companies have gone to the trouble of localizing the experience, localizing the platform, the marketing, to, to be a little bit more in, in keeping and, and in the um, cultural vibe of, of, of how we do things in the UK. And one example that I like to give is that um, a lot of demo data that you will see in platforms when people are doing walkthroughs is demo data from other countries. And if you can spend that little bit of time just, just creating an experience and creating a user, a use case and a user experience of flow in your demos of, of, of UK people, of UK addresses, of pound sterling, of, of, of certain types of formatting, it, it does make a difference because it feels like you've you've landed in earnest. You know, you're really uh, it's not a it's not a kind of I'll give it a punt and see what happens. It looks more like you're taking the, the market entry seriously. So I'd say the localization matters. I'd also say um, that kind of flows into the cultural differences. So I, I, I we, we usually see that the way that the Canadian market and the UK market works together. Uh, there, there's a huge amount of um, similarity in the mindset and the approach to business and such like. Um, but there, I, I would say that UK business decision makers make themselves difficult to reach, make themselves difficult to talk to, are immensely cynical when you, <laughs> you get them on the phone and will typically call things out and, and 
can often be quite curse. And I'm making some ridiculous generalizations for effect here, but uh, you know, I think Canada is seen as, as having a similar mindset, having a similar, similar business culture, more so than the US. And you can lean on that a lot in the way that you, you sell uh, and actually, you know, introducing the fact you're, you're from Canada at the very beginning of the, the conversation is always going to be a, a, a tick in a box, I would say. Um, you will see competition in the UK that you won't see in North America, and you will probably see more of it than you're expecting. Uh, and that's because there's a huge amount of governmental and EU investment going into technology, uh, technology transformation. So in the UK, there's a heavy focus on fintech. Uh, as well as creative industries and other things. But in fintech, there are a lot of accelerators run by Barclays Rise and you know, Barclays Eagle Labs, that kind of thing, <clears throat> where you'll just see a load of competitors, weird and wonderfuls, of all sorts of sizes. You'll see all of the German competitors, the French, the Italian, the Spanish startups, which are all trying to get into the UK market on their way over to North America, and the Israeli startups that maybe think they'll try them, they'll try US and UK at the same time. So you will see a lot of uh, a lot of competition that, that you might not be expecting to see. So be prepared for that and, and make sure you take good account of it when you're when you're considering your market entry. And then based on the cultural, let's say cultural differences, albeit they're not huge, um, we think that decisions tend to be slower in the UK than they are in North America. I think in the US, there's very much a top down um, speak to the CEO and then the CEO will affect change in their business. You would typically find the UK CEO taking a more hands-off approach. It's not always the case, but it's much more difficult to go absolutely top down from the board because most of the time CEOs will defer to their experts that they've they put into their business. So you tend to end up going in at a kind of VP director level and then fanning out into the business to get board approval and also to get um, uh, subject matter experts in specific roles around IT or regulatory or whatever it might be. So just consider that because what you might think is a three month sales cycle might end up being a four, five, six month sales cycle, depending on the type of product you're, you're, you're selling. Um, so you should factor that into the way that you budget to, to enter the UK market. So moving on, um, what we wanna talk about here is what you, can, what, you, what you will definitely need and what you can definitely avoid spending money on for the time being uh, as you make your UK market entry. And then what are the things in that middle ground as well? So what we what we start by saying is a local resource is pretty essential. And I think, um, uh, you know, David and Jill uh, made the comment that it's the time zone as much as anything is the killer. And having almost no time to do your calls, unless, unless you're going to change your lifestyle for the worst, and, and we wouldn't suggest you do that, uh, there, there are really two things to consider, which is, um, first of all, the time zone becomes incredibly difficult over time unless you've built your entire business around that. And if you've got your business is running red hot in your local market, it will really start to fray at the edges when you're trying to manage this eight hour time difference or, or uh, you know, that, that, that level of time difference is pretty punishing. Um, so the, the other reason for having a local resource is that ability to respond very, very rapidly to customer requests when they need things turned around. I've got a board meeting this afternoon. I need something from you. I need the following things. And, and it's relevant whether or not you travel to the customer. So when we started working with Hostopia, the ability to jump on a tube and be at BT headquarters in 25 minutes was absolutely essential to them because we'd go in to sit in GTM meetings with the management team of BT, plus a whole load of their marketing experts and a bunch of the other partners and sit alongside them, alongside Microsoft, alongside um, uh, you know, uh, the Blackberries and others of, of the world. So it's important to have people in country for, for those reasons. And then you've got that cultural secret source on top. And I think the cultural piece really starts to resonate when you get outside of London. So I've been to Newcastle lots of times. I've been to Edinburgh lots of times. I've been to, I've been over to Northern Ireland. I, I know how things tick, what the cultural differences are between the different parts of the UK. And also that's an important point that you know, uh, don't don't try try not to be too London centric because there's so much competition there. There's a there's a real benefit to spreading yourself across that UK market with a with a local resource that knows what they're what they're doing. Um, a strategy uh, is a bit of an obvious statement. Um, again, uh, we we don't want to sound flippant in saying this. It's more a case of if you copy paste what you're doing, you don't necessarily take account of um, how your ICP might differ. So if you're looking at restaurateurs in the 
in the UK, hospitality industry in the UK, it, it's under pressure from two areas. One is COVID and the fact that they're trying to unlock and, and, and trying to digitally transform and do business as, as, as much as they can and prepare for reopening. And that whole thing is very tough. And then they've got Brexit. And as part of Brexit, less, less access to, um, uh, to, to European workers who are, who are happy to come across to the UK, maybe work for two days in a hospitality job, uh, take some money back and then go and do whatever they're going to do next. That trend has kind of been stifled to a certain extent. So there are a number of pressures, as well as the, the additional costs of carriage um, of, of getting, uh, getting product into the UK. Uh, as we import food and uh, and associated stuff, so uh, that strategy just needs to be looked at through a UK centric lens, and we don't usually in our work change that strategy by a huge degree, but it's just it gives you that immediate sense of okay, well this bit will resonate, this bit won't. These types of businesses you want to be focusing up market or down market in order to get the same kind of impact as you've had in Canada. So uh, uh, do bear that in mind and do bear bear the the kind of refocusing of your ideal customer profile um, in when you're when you're entering the UK. Um, and, and the final thing is think about how much support you'll need to provide from from HQ level. So our most successful clients consider our team to be an extension of their business. And whatever you do in the UK market, however you do it, you should have that kind of sense of you have a team in the UK, you make them part of your business, you involve them in absolutely everything. And you have specific people who have been earmarked to support those, those individuals. So a management sponsor that can make difficult decisions very rapidly without having to get buy-in from everybody else. And the other really essential thing is a, a solutions engineer or a pre-sales person who can be on, on the time zone. You don't have to fly them over necessarily, but they need to be working on shift and they need to be getting up at five, six, seven in the morning. We've been working with somebody, uh, one of our clients who was getting up at uh, at three, go to bed, get up at three, do a few hours work, go back to bed, and then get up again. Uh, so you know, think about how you're gonna how you're gonna provide that real solution architect, subject matter expertise, killer demos, all of those things. Answer the difficult questions in one meeting, not wait for five meetings and twenty emails to go past before you nail down that opportunity because it'll go to someone else. It'll go to one of your German competitors, one of your Israeli competitors. So those are the things that we think are really important. So I won't spend quite so much time on the other points, but um, what you can do without is an office. And that was true before, and it's even more true now. Um, at most, you should just have a managed mailbox, somewhere you can have your mail dropped. And so your local, your local person or your local team can collect that mail and, and, and respond accordingly. They're usually junk mail or Christmas cards from people, uh, things like that. But um, what we would say is, that office is, has often been seen as I need to land, I need to be there, I need to be physically there. People just don't buy that anymore. They don't need it. And we've, we've never, we've even had offices as, as channel creator that we've downsized and then, and then got rid of because nobody needs it. So we operate from a virtualized environment. Um, and it's, it's, it means you can spend your money on the important stuff, which is looking after your customers, acquiring them, keeping them happy, supporting them and growing them. Um, the other thing that a lot of people ask about is a, is a legal entity. Do you need a, a, a UK limited? And the answer is no. So you, most of these customers will be very, very happy to buy from your Canadian or US framework agreement, depending on where you've put your, uh, your, your kind of legal hub, um, uh, you know, for at the, per, at the time of this conversation, then contract from there. And if a customer wants you to contract from the UK, they have to be spending hundreds of thousands to make it worth your while to do that because the tax and the legal and the regulatory and all the other implications are significant. So wait until you're pushed to do that by a really big customer and then do that homework at that point. It, it's often worth having a think about it. You know, if the UK market's starting to kick in, how might we do that in the future? But nearly all the UK customers and partners are happy and have been happy for the last 10, 15 years in, in our work to sign on, on Canadian terms. So, so don't, don't consider that to be a blocker or a reason to hold back. Um, uh, not that many of you have by the looks of the, uh, the, the numbers on the, uh, on, on the poll earlier on. Uh, the final thing is a lot of people put a country manager and a marketing head in. And actually, if you put a, a country manager in place and they're partly managing the, the kind of 
legals and the structures, partly doing the sales. <clears throat> and then you put a marketing person in. Invariably, that marketing person doesn't have enough to do because even when we've run teams of four or five people in, the, in a country, we've only ever needed maybe a quarter or half of a marketing person to support marketing coordination, marketing production. So if you put a whole marketing head in, then they end up having to do other stuff. So the question is, what are they doing? And are they doing a good job of it? And usually it's they're doing the wrong things and they're not doing a very good job of it. So you're better off doing your marketing from HQ or using piecemeal agency services to build up your marketing mix in the new market. And then think about that marketing person in year maybe two at earliest, usually year three or beyond. And, and, and we would say that's a much better way of, of spending your money in that, in that regard. Uh, finally, uh, what other stuff might you need? So a GBP price list is appreciated, but not essential. And the reason it's a good thing is because uh, the FD will find it easier to, uh, to sign off on your proposal. So if they get a GBP price list, they know they fix the prices, even if it means that you're having to hedge a little bit of your FX currencies on the, on the other end. It looks good for a UK business to know that they fixed in and they're going to be paying a grand a month or 10 grand a month or half a million in year one or whatever it might be. So a GBP price list is, is a good idea, although not, it isn't essential. Uh, the other thing is um, a partner program. Even in your very first iteration of, of work in the UK, if you don't do partners, it can come back to bite. And we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. But partnerships and ecosystems take a long time to build. And if you don't start early, later on, you can really feel the backlash as other companies, partner ecosystems start to kick in because you'll start to see them winning everything and also just getting traction and leads at, at, at a, an entirely different level to, to what you're able to do if you're only going direct. Um, and the final thing is consider events, but, but so many people are reliant on events. And, uh, and, and clearly at the moment, you can't be reliant on events, but we do see a time where those events, businesses are going to get back on their feet and those, uh, you know, the, the big convention centers are going to start filling up again. Events for lead gen are not a good, <laughs> they're not good for lead gen. I'll just put it bluntly. What they are good for is brand awareness and being seen. You may harvest a few leads. You can expect that 90% of your leads won't fit your ideal customer profile. And if you get a few lucky hits, then that's great. But think about your events as being a brand exercise to make people feel like you're a serious player, you've landed. So pick two good ones and go large rather than 10, 10, 10 and, and you know, have a, a small thing in a corner. So, so you know, it's better to double down on big things and uh, make more of a splash and you get that branding equity as, as, as part of that. So we then wanted to talk a little bit about, about channels. So um, what we see a lot of is, uh, is it North American firms have a real heritage of direct sales and also North American selling does have that kind of sea level you go in at the board and you, you get sponsored down um, and, and we know that's an oversimplification but you know in, in terms of how we then see how the UK market differs and how you would work onwardly into Europe um, that that doesn't it, it doesn't work as well number one so you don't get as much traction in your direct selling when you're when you're here and also the the concept that you have more control is actually not true because what happens when you get to the final two, and we had this with one of our clients um, uh, from Cyprus, so European HR technology business, and they were focusing on direct bids in their first year, and they got to the last two in 20 bids, and they lost every single bid. Why did they lose every single bid? Because there was an advocate or an incumbent partner in every one of those companies advising for either the safe option or the option that they were sponsoring and had a relationship with. So what we would say is it, it's, it does take a long time. It's messy. It's complicated. Uh, you can really boil it down. We've actually got a blog that we put together about what's the absolute baseline, leanest way of building a partner program and, and the structures for that partner program. Um, but when it comes to the final decision or where you're getting towards the end of those sales cycles, you need multiple advocates. You need voices from all angles and influence from all around to get those customers to say yes. And if you imagine, it's like, am I gonna go for the Canadian, haven't heard of them before, or the UK, they're a bit more expensive, but the guys around the corner and the whole company was founded on Fleet Street. It, it becomes that, that kind of, you need the additional voices in order to back up and to reinforce the fact that you're a solid decision and, uh, and you've got friends and, uh, 
uh, and contacts on the ground. So don't underestimate the power of the, the channel when you get to that, to that stage. Um, what we usually do is we, we put together a bit of a, a structure of, of what a partner ecosystem might look like. So, you know, you've got your, your, the objective is leads, the objective is business. And you need to look at how different parts of the partner ecosystem might influence that. And obviously you've got your direct business on, on this little drawing here, we've got that, uh, this schematic, you've got the, the direct stuff on the bottom and you've got the, uh, the, the indirect on the top. So where you, the way you should think about channel is often channel is thought about as resellers. And we would say in the UK, and as you, as you span out into Europe, it's not about resellers. It's about advocates who are informing the strategy of your customers, especially when you get into the enterprise tier. You don't really get enterprise resale. What you get is companies like Accenture and Capgemini and Beringa and let's say the large and mid tier uh, transformation and advisory houses, the big consulting firms who are telling the customer where to go and why. And also they're telling them what not to buy. So you need to be in there. You need to have socialized your proposition across those, those, those borders. So, you know, you, we've got ticks here in some, some random boxes to give you a bit of a sense of, of what you might consider. But, you know, strategy and digital consultancies really inform what the customer decides. So companies that, that are the delivering the technology, the system integrators, the, the, the full service agencies, again, they have a huge amount of influence on we build it on this platform because it's the best and because it facilitates these things and integrates to these other things. And when you get to integrating to those other things, you know, are you, are you in that ecosystem? Are you integrated with Xero? Are you integrated with Sage? Are you connected to Salesforce, to the cloud, to all of these different platforms, Microsoft Business Central? Those, those are the things that start to make those decisions. And if you haven't got those ready-made connections or those, those pathways open, you can lose a lot of business as a result. So that's really what we talk about when we're talking about channel is you, you want something very rounded ecosystem. You start building out in the essential areas where it's gonna facilitate your business the most, and then you build it into a really robust uh, and, and kind of 360 type of, uh, type of channel. Um, and of course, if you don't, someone else will. And that someone else might not be winning everything in year one, but we can definitely guarantee that if you don't do it, then by year three, they will be winning everything. And we've seen it in, in a number of occasions. And um, what I wanted to do at, at this point is uh, hand over to Elias Mabayad, uh, uh, Paul and my business partner of, of many years, uh, one of the senior partners here and, and owners of Channel Creator. Um, and he'll introduce himself, a bit of background, and then just talk about our experiences of the impact of Channel um, for one of our longest standing customers, Satona. Thanks, Matt. Um, and hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'll, I'll be fairly brief. It's just it's one data point, one anecdote, but I think it, it sort of illustrates some of the points uh, that Matt has made. Uh, in terms of my background, um, I am Canadian, although I've lived in the UK now for 24 years. Um, I was sent over, in fact, by a Boston based at the time um, video conferencing company to help them with their European expansion and, and sort of build, build that cultural, I guess, connection between head office and the German, French and UK um, uh, operation. And at that time, uh, so, and I've been in sales and marketing for enterprise software and or early stage startups ever since. Uh, Sertona was a San Diego based uh, predictive analytics uh, company. So they, they built a, uh, they had a SaaS solution that they sold into, into retail and, and online commerce. Um, in fact, they, had, they were one of the leaders in the US and in North America. They had built themselves up to being one of the two main um, you know, finalists in every decision that most retailers made. They had over 100 employees and were well established. And I think the message there was they came to the UK two years too late. So their main competitor just up the road in San Francisco had entered the UK market two and a half years earlier. And by the time these guys came along, all of the big marquee clients had been hoovered up. Uh, and so entering the market was suddenly a lot harder. So there is a decision to be made, when's the right time? Um, when you've hit over a hundred individuals in your company, it's probably already a little bit too late. Um, and, and their mentality was, we will service the UK and the European market um, and, and deal with it on an ad hoc basis. Um, and in their particular case, what happened was they signed up a UK 
um, retailer who was maybe forward thinking and, and you know, willing to take a, a chance with something considered to be bleeding edge technology and they signed up with them. But that wasn't the, the, the rest of the market. So when, when we started working with them, we started on a direct sales strategy because that is what they insisted upon. Um, and we, we did win a few uh, accounts and clients for them. But what then also became very, very clear is in this particular case, the, um, uh, the, the, I guess the piece of the pie, which is the new and existing uh, as systems integrators, they were the ones or they were the, the, the partners to these e-commerce retailers who were building out their whole e-commerce uh, presence online. And so when this particular platform came along, uh, they would also have to integrate it in. And because they all had relationships with the incumbent from San Francisco, there was absolutely no chance that they would endorse or in any way advocate for that platform. And you know, to the point of uh, that HR example uh, that, that Matt gave from Cyprus, where you know, they were the finalist or the one of the final two, it doesn't matter if you come second, they lost the deal. And so it was a very, very difficult period of time for them, uh, especially since they were typically on 12 to 18 month sales cycles. So that suddenly, uh, what that meant in effect was that although they, they managed to build a profitable European business, it was very small. They only ever expanded it to a, to a certain size and still really relied upon the North American uh, business for them. So I guess two, two takeaways. Number one, um, very much about timing. Don't leave it too late. Um, too early is also a challenge, but certainly don't leave it too late. And the second piece is the sort of the intangible um, benefit of over the longer term, um, devoting some time to understanding what is the ecosystem, building relationships with the ecosystem. And in many cases, you know, those partnerships were not about mutual lead referral. They were, they were much more about intelligence, you know, early warning system into, hey, I'm just speaking to my friend over there. They're replatforming, but they're also looking for X, Y, Z solution. You guys should get in there before they start to, um, you know, exclude you from that selection process. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that, Matt. Any questions, maybe stick them on the chat and, uh, and Paul will pick them up later and we can address them. Great stuff. Thanks so much, Elias. Um, very good. So again, yeah, we can we can field more questions about some of uh, some of the points that Elias covered there. But uh, yeah, as I say, there there are a number of things you can do in channel in terms of building a channel program and a partner program and uh, uh, and, and a strategy which doesn't have to be all encompassing. It doesn't have to start big. It can start with the really key areas which you can pick off with a with with a manageable amount of resource. Uh, and often we have a resource that's covering both direct and indirect at the same time, just so that you get something started and, and, and you don't leave channel too late as Elias described there. So um, we, we did also wanna talk about some of the, 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 key, uh, the key stages of, of building a successful channel. And, um, and we've got two, two ways that we see this. Along the, along the bottom, um, there's some content that we've got on the site and on the blog that we put together around um, around how you build out an early stage market, be it geographical or be it a new vertical segment or new channel segment. Um, and so what, what, what we've then done is we've said, these stages are select your targets, validate your instincts, build a pipeline and win pilots, and then repeat and expand. On top of that, you can kind of use this methodology, which is for both direct and indirect selling, to inform a little bit about how you build your, your partner ecosystem. So. What we typically do when we're building a partner ecosystem is we start small. And that means we identify a number of partners in the UK market. Uh, you might look at 20 SIs, 20 uh, advisory consultancies, change management, uh, digital transformation type businesses. Uh, we might take another 20 thought leaders, analysts, those sorts of businesses in that kind of publishing and advisory end of the, the market. And on the other end, you might have some technology partners that could integrate as a white label proposition or, or be a sell through or sell with. Uh, and, and if you can define your, your various segments of, of channel, you can very quickly then go and survey those businesses. So in this engage phase that you've got on the left-hand side here, 
it's all about getting round. We, we do something called a validation. So once you've worked out what your plan is, we do a validate. It takes two months and a senior individual goes around and talks to these 20 companies per segment. And you won't get all of them, of course. You won't, you won't have a 100% hit rate and speak to all 20 in every segment, but you'll get enough information and enough intelligence to understand that all the SIs are blocked. They've already got something. Some of the advisory firms are not satisfied with the, the experiences their customers that have had. They're looking somewhere else. All the thought leaders are just looking for the next shiny object. So great, jump in. And then the tech partners, you know, maybe some of them have integration, some of them don't. Maybe some of them have API potential and you can start to integrate a proposition and, and co-sell with them. So by the end of two, by the end of a month's planning and two months of, of surveying and, and validating, as we call it, you can get a really robust view of what the market looks like. And, and where does that get you to? Well, it, it, it's that validation is a pipeline because invariably of 80 potential conversations, you may have 10 or 15 percent of those that turn into meaningful sales engagements or meaningful partner conversations. So what we then try and do with the partners is a pilot. And that's a pilot in one of two directions. Either we bring something from our network of, of, of direct leads to the partnership to catalyze that partnership. The other way is to find partners that say, oh, Paul, it's funny you called me today because I was only speaking to a customer about this last week and we absolutely need a solution like this. So if you can fit into this framework, you can fit into this world, you may well be able to do a deal with us. Let's talk about what that would look like. And you can get into these quite soft conversations around, okay, well, let's do a pilot project together. The pilot is not a pretend project. It's not a cut down one. It's just the project which proves whether that partnership is going to go the distance or not. So obviously what you want to do with that, pi with that pilot is absolutely smash it out of the park. And, and if you don't, that news will travel. So piloting is all about delivering the best possible customer experience and even more importantly, the best possible partner experience. So once you've got that, pi that, that anchor tenant, that anchor project with your partner, you, you can, we, this is something we did with Javelin Group. So we, we found a project with uh, the Harry Potter um, e-book shop called Pottermore. And there was a project that was going south and we managed to rescue that project, or rather we, we, we took the project and the project assurance team and we brought that opportunity to Javelin Group, which is the number one e-commerce uh, SI in the UK market. And it just happens to line up beautifully, more, <laughs> more so than we could possibly claim credit for ourselves, but we kind of put the pieces together and then the thing just shot off like a rocket. Um, and that, that project resulted in a really good experience for Javelin, a really good experience for the client, but more importantly, 50 developers were trained and five solution architects and two salespeople and the marketing team and, and, and. So by the end of that project, because of the size and the, the strategic importance of it, we'd already got to this stage called Enable, which is everybody in that business needs to know what your proposition is and does and how they can sell it and why they should sell it, because it'll make them a lot of money. And also that first pilot just went off like an absolute dream. And it was a, a you know, the absolute perfect poster child of, of what a project should be. So if you can get into that enablement phase and really socialize your product across every channel of that business, you can very quickly get into the, the, the DNA of a partner. And, and I say very quickly, uh, that's an overstatement. With Javelin, it took two years, it took a year to get the project and, and win it and, and bring it home. It's 13 months is actually the exact amount of time. Uh, and then it took another year to deliver that project and build that enablement. And then we got into what we call the sell phase, which is every project, which was a B2B to C, which had digital asset management involved in it, or had some complexities around backend integration, became a project for our client and nobody else got a look in. So if, it, if a project came in with a certain set of criteria or characteristics, it just went to our client and it wouldn't go anywhere else. And that's where you're in that Intel inside phase. We, we usually say, try and be the thing that they have to think about removing from every proposal, that they have to remove from every device. It's like, it just goes out the door with every single deal they do, unless they make a really uh, definitive decision not to do so. So a few thoughts about how you can build a channel out there. Hopefully that, that's helpful, but we have a whole load more content um, and, and information on the site and, and we'll be building that library out uh, over the coming months. I guess um, in terms of, of how the UK can prepare you for Europe, I want to be quite brief on this because I think it's everything that we've already said. And, and so I just want to reiterate it, which is the European mindset um, and, and probably David will have some interesting experiences from his colleagues in Belgium here. And, you know, 
and, and, and his, his work and his conversations with the team in the UK and Belgium is um, the mindset is similar, but more so, if I can put it that way. So you've got uh, the, 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 the same level of kind of politics and you don't tend to go in at the CEO and, and, and it tends to be a little bit slower and, uh, and maybe they, they favor European businesses. So UK is, is a really good testing ground for that sales approach that is then gonna continue to work across the European market. Um, there, there are obviously other complexities um, around not only the, the competition, but also localization. So local competitors from Germany, from UK, et cetera, will have really, really solid localizations into many, many uh, languages, currencies, um, appropriate taxation rules, whatever those, those localizations or local integrations are. Just think about how rich those are gonna be and that will inform a little bit about what you need to think of before you go into each of those European markets. And uh, again, local team on the ground can say, you only need to integrate to this and this, and you've covered 70% of the market. So, you know, go for the low hanging fruit, go for the easy wins in terms of what's going to give you uh, the biggest coverage with the, the, the least effort. Um, and again, what is great about channel in, in the UK is you can stamp it out across Europe. And, and that means either you use the same model at, a, at the very minimum, but if you think about what we did with Javelin Group and the, the story I shared a moment ago, Javelin Group went on to win projects in the UK, like Majestic Wine, which is a, a kind of well-known wine warehouse in the UK. But then they started winning projects in Belgium with Jumbo Supermarkets and uh, projects in Germany and products in, projects in the Nordics. So those companies, those channels, if they are the right shape and size, can, they can be the facilitators for your European business and you can ride into Europe on their coattails. So choosing those right partners in the beginning really gives you a great opportunity then to, to build out your business on the back of those, those relationships. So the final slide and then we'll get into the, the wrap up is, is about Brexit. So obviously it's always the elephant in the room. Again, uh, many thanks to David for addressing it head on at the beginning. So uh, is it the end of the world? Um, obviously, if you're shipping product, I, this is a massive overstatement, right? But um, you know, there are some difficulties unfolding at the moment about getting products in and out of Europe, uh, across the, uh, the channel, across the UK border. And it's because it's new paperwork, it's new bureaucracy, everybody has to learn something new and therefore, and everybody's lazy, obviously, you know, uh, 7,000 guys driving trucks across <laughs> across the channel and then get to the other side and they've got a load of paperwork they haven't seen before and and obviously they then have to spend a lot of time trying to socialize what is it I should be signing and okay I haven't got the authority and so there's definitely a bump in the road in terms of shipping the product longer term there will probably be some tariffs which will impact certain areas of trade and certain types of products more than others but just think back to what we said at the beginning of the session which is that if you are a services business and 70% of the UK's business is in services, there's a huge amount of market to go after that isn't being impacted by Brexit. Or if it is being impacted, it's being impacted either not very much or in certain cases very positively. So there are as many positive cases for what's happening to businesses and how they're growing as there are negatives. So I'm a, I'm a Ramona uh, uh, so for my sins. So I was, I was on the, I'd like to stay in Europe, please. And I think you know, kind of philosophically and culturally, I, fe I feel European, I consider myself to be European. And obviously there's a, there's a huge variance in the UK across people who like how, the, how Europe rolls and people who that like <laughs> can't wait to see the back of it as, as the numbers in the, uh, in the referendum would suggest. So whilst, whilst, the products, whilst the products are a little bit of a problem, but don't be scared by that because, you know, that'll get fixed over in due course. We haven't actually seen any impact in the software and services that we've been selling. So if you're selling services like consulting around a product, the only time that you're going to get hit by a Brexit related issue is if you want to send some people from the UK to live in the Czech Republic for the next three years and they need a working visa. So, yeah, OK, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's tough if you run a broadcasting company or you run a um, uh, you run a production company and you want to land a whole load of cast and crew in Hungary to do the next uh, you know, Game of Thrones or whatever it might be. But if you're selling software and if you're selling services and the associated deliverables around that, it has actually had uh, zero impact, right? So it, it just hasn't had, <laughs> we, we haven't changed our business one bit 
from the 31st of December to the 1st of January. And thankfully, you know, there, there has been no impact. There has been no requirement for us to change that business model. Obviously, we're a very lean organization. There's, there's not much paperwork or, or not, you know, not many assets in the business from that respect. But it, it's worth thinking about the fact that from the outside, it looks like everything, you know, all hell's breaking loose. Actually, what we're doing here is kind of cracking on with our day job. And um, so obviously, uh, the other, the other, the scenario is uh, if you're Nigel Farage, then you're pretty pleased with yourself right now. So much so that you've given up politics and you're just going to uh, sit on your boat and uh, and enjoy the view. Um, and, and then the final, the final thing that that we have seen from one of our very long-standing clients, a guy called Jorge Carvalho, is now the VP of Web Services in this business, and he he shared with us the fact that um, from his view, Brexit makes things more complicated. Not necessarily because from a regulatory point of view, it, it, it adds complexity because, as I mentioned before, you shouldn't see a, a huge amount of that when you're selling software and tech into the, into the market. Um, what, what changes is the fact that you need to have people that understand how it's playing out so they can stop it being an issue. So if people don't know how to, uh, to deal with the objection of how does Brexit impact it, it becomes a blocker. Uh, but if you have the right people in the room, then you can make that 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 objection go away within about two sentences. So again, it's it's important to have the right people and the right knowledge on the ground in the market, just so that you can socialize the the realities of of what it means for a software or technology company, which is um, pretty much business as usual. So the final slide that we'll share is is just this um, uh, a little bit of a, a kind of. Um, food for thought on the types of models that people use when they're going into the uh, the, the UK. Obviously, this is uh, total propaganda on the part of channel creator. But what I would say is that we are part of a, a growing trend towards sales outsourcing businesses and businesses that offer these sorts of, of services as on a kind of pay as you go um, contract model. So obviously, you can hire a local team. My question is always this, if you're going to hire a local team, and you're going into the UK market, and you start off thinking that you're going to land in the UK fintech scene, and then you land in the UK fintech scene, and you find out that actually fintechs aren't buying it, but supply chain companies are. But you've got a person, a GM, who's a specialist in fintech. So you then have to get your GM to retrain in supply chain, and maybe that's not the best way of resourcing that role. So actually going in with a scouting facility, if you like, understanding what's, what's going to land in the market, building out your customer base and then resourcing up on the back of that. In the end, the objective should always be to have a local team. How you get there is the question. And then there are a couple of options, which is you've got sales outsourcing. Again, as I mentioned, we're, we're one of a, a large number of European outsourcers that have good track record and you know a number of years under our belt of doing successful projects. You've also got distributors. And the only thing that we would always say about distributors is that you, see, you lack a little bit of control because you haven't got that, um, you, uh, you haven't got the, the carrot and stick, if you will, to control that distributor with. If you're one of 30, 40, 50 products, then if your product doesn't bite and if the marketing doesn't really hit home in the early stages and you haven't got a funded head, you can often get lost in the distributor or you lack the control because they, they own the end customer billing. And then you have to find a way of getting those customers back onto your letterhead, so back onto your paperwork when you land yourself in that market later on. So just consider sales outsourcing as being one of those options on the table that people often don't think of. They think I need my own team, I need my own salespeople. And our argument would be, actually you don't. What you need is customer contracts and you need that value and more equity value because of international customers. So you get more money when you do your next raise. And that's what, that's what this, is, this is really about. So with that, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna wind up there. We do have a, Q&A session, which is being moderated by my beautiful assistant, Paul Brothers, who is going to introduce himself now. And then if you do want to, uh, we do offer um, one hour clinics to companies that are looking to enter the UK market or go further afield into Europe. And we'd be delighted to facilitate one of those. You can book it through the Calendly or you can get in touch with us directly. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.